Hi again. Uh, <laughs> all right, let me rephrase the question from yesterday. Um, Tur I just popped up on Bloomberg. Turkey seeks to be the first NATO member to join the China Land SEO. The market signals, I, I loved your speech, by the way, it was wonderful, but the market has clearly been confirming everything you've said so far. What's it going to take for Europe to flip sides? For Europe to what? To flip, get away from its vassal status and look east. Yeah, it's difficult to say. Initially, you know, when, when the whole thing started, there was a celebration of European unity. This brings us all together. Um, because now we are all in that same sort of war uh, and we love each other all as opposed to them. In the meantime, of course, you see that the European Union is on the verge of breaking apart. Um, the Hungarians don't cooperate there. Uh, in different countries, they are no longer willing, for instance, to, to send gas or oil to Germany because Germany is obviously the most idiotic country right now in Europe. Um, and the Germans, of course, are, but there should be inner European solidarity. Um, so if the European Union breaks apart, uh, which I can imagine would be possible if that war drags on for another year or so, then that might also initiate some sort of break with, with the U.S. Um, they, are also, they also celebrated, for instance, that NATO has again been expanded, including now uh, Sweden and, and Finland. Um, but I think um, Sean Gebb yesterday talked about these, these types of problems too. Yeah, that all of this increases conflicts because you have now lots of small countries that are in a position to provoke major wars. I think Lithuania has behaved in a way that I think is just absolutely stupid. Um, that is, trying to escalate the whole thing, even though you must know that <laughs> even if the United States would come to your help, which I doubt very much, there would be nothing left of Lithuania. Um, that, I mean, that takes one day and the whole country is finished. Um, and that other countries like Germany and so forth do not realize that even support Lithuania in, in these extra provocations that they do. That is, yeah, how can I say? It is a, uh, a situation that I never imagined would be possible. But, again, may I add something, something especially concerning, concerning Europe? Europe? I, I can, can imagine that, that from a very general point of view, you know, Google Earth view, um, also historically, um, that, that we have um, areas of concentration, like US, like China, like Russia, more or less, maybe. And Europe was something like the rest of a decentralized um, I, I do not speak now about Africa and, North and South America, but that, that's another story. But among these, I think Europe is a sort of area of still living decentralization. I mean, the, the typical um, character of Europe during history was decentralization, with attempts, of course, decentralization, with these empires, different empires, but in principle that was decentralized. Now there is a, a next um, attempt going on towards centralization with the EU toward the United States of Europe. And let's hope that um, that won't work, that the decentralized aspect is perhaps still living, you know, that there are diversity, many languages, many cultures, so that could be maybe the place where decentralized could start 
worldwide in the end, perhaps, and such uh, problems like Brexit and others, and uh, problems with Poland, with, with Hungary and so on, these could be signs that something is going on in that direction. I hope so, at least. What I find most uh, extraordinary is the degree to which history has been wiped out of this perception of, of conflict. In, in the few you, you talked about this, uh, uh, two, until a year ago, everybody knew that Ukraine was a corrupt uh, concoction and a remainder of the policies of Lenin and Stalin and Khrushchev, because the, the country of Ukraine is, is not older than the communist uh, takeover in Russia, right? And the, uh, all these uh, historical dimensions, which are very pertinent to what actually happens, never make it in, uh, to the media. And so the, everything depends on whether the narrative in the media will ever break down or erode, because as long as this narrative is kept alive, uh, by the professional fabulator class, not the PFS, uh, but the, the media societies, the global media societies, which dominate the perception of everything. I noticed when, when the, the COVID pandemic struck, uh, there were a few people uh, that contacted me and they said, this cannot be true. And this, their story was, the media are lying to us. And then the moment uh, COVID disappeared from the front page and Ukraine was there, they were fully embracing the media narrative of, of the Ukraine war, right? And uh, you were always on the defensive as long as this uh, idea that truth is coming from the media because it's direct from television, because it's direct because CNN as a reporter somewhere in a hotel uh, uh, telling you something. As long as this perception persists, I don't see uh, what else to expect except uh, one crisis after another, a fabrication of crisis, and it will always be the, the same. Uh, players behind it, right? because only a few interests are capable of mobilizing all these uh, people at the same time. And that is perhaps the biggest challenge, to not to give in in the first place, and second, to, uh, to spread doubt and skepticism. Otherwise, I don't know. You know maybe I add a little bit. Ukraine in the current size has never really existed. Um, the large parts were part of the Austrian Empire. Poland ruled large parts of the, of the Ukraine for a while. The Crimea has always been a Russian place, uh, even Odessa. Um, so to pretend now that this is some sort of historically grown nation that has always existed in the current composition is just plain nonsense. Um, but the media, as you said, they present it as Ukraine is always like this. There are always Ukrainians and Ukrainians. No, there, there, there is not even uh, something that you can say. All of these people currently living in what is now defined as Ukraine consider themselves Ukrainian. Professor Hoppe, I have a question for you uh, about the process of centralization with the globalization and uh, also we're coming from this decentralized uh, Europe, but recently the whole pandemic war was supposed to centralize uh, the European nations would say, also centralized with, uh, with the USA. There are process of harmonization of the law, unification of the law. Even the America, is apply, you, you need to apply some regulation in terms of financial markets into European Union. So the question is, does it stop 
and actually we start the process of decentralization uh, once again because of the war and because of the uh, energy crisis and everything that is happening and the centralization maybe will it move to digital space like CBDCs, uh, single some currency areas uh, that can be brought from the, the CBDCs, first national CBDCs but then worldwide uh, one currency. Uh, central bank digital currency, I'm not saying that Bitcoin would be, I'm not, they're not pushing for Bitcoin obviously, but uh, is it the process will start a uh, stop on the institutional level and move to more decentralization and centralization would be in digital space. So what do you think about that? Um, now, there are processes of centralization that are good. Um, I'd say if we would have a one world money as we did have under the gold standard, um, that is an eminently reasonable centralization because just having one currency uh, is more efficient than having multiple currencies. On the other hand, if you have fiat currencies, then you would rather have, want to have competition between them because that curtails the natural inclination of every, every fiat money producer to produce more fiat money because then the exchange, the exchange rate of these currencies would continuously decline and people would go someplace else. We see that that's why we have this tendency of Bitcoin. People try to avoid um, uh, fiat, uh, fiat currencies. Um, as far as the question is concerned, whether this type of tendency will also yeah, lead to or will be completely independent of yeah, the ter territorial uh, uh, concentration. I'm not so sure about that um, because, again, uh, there, will be always, there will be always a tendency to enlarge your turf and then regulate even the different types of currencies that might exist before. It is hard hard to say um, what will result from all of this. I mean, as, as, as David Durr said, I, I hope this will initiate a process also of territorial decentralization, which then automatically also implies some sort of monetary decentralization, but does not take away the incentive to create some, some global currency because economic reason speaks in favor of, um, of a worldwide currency, except not a fiat currency. But I'm not sure if I, if I addressed the question that you asked or I, or I missed, missed some of your points. And also, also uh, something, something um, that, that, that theory or, the, or that, that, that approach that, that maybe under certain condition uh, one current currency could be an advantage. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I mean, I'm not the economist or the specialist in this, but I discussed um, viewpoints um, already that um, why not to have several currencies, good currencies, uh, in, co in neutral competition, but they do not fit for everything. One currency does more fit for small payments, another currency for treasuring and so on, and um, that there, like, you know, car competition, one car is more uh, fit for, you know, countryside, the other one for the city, smaller, bigger cars and so on. Why not diff having different currencies for different purposes? And apart from that, I think that a dominant currency like the US dollar, 
um, is not covered by gold anymore, that's not by coincidence. That's because they had a, not, not a legal, but a de facto uh, monopoly, and monopolies are always abused, and that's why they, they, they have the arrogance to drop the gold standard. I have to contradict that a little bit. Um, from a purely economic point of view, a single currency is of offers tremendous advantages. Um, if you have multiple currencies, you are in a system of partial barter. Um, so it is precisely the purpose of, of money to avoid barter trade. Um, so under the gold standard, we did have an international uh, monetary standard. Um, the entire world, more or less the entire world, used the same commodity as money, and, and you can have that in any denomination that you want. I mean, for small trans transactions, you can also sometimes have tickets that entitled you to a certain amount of gold and so forth. Yeah, but you want to, av to facilitate trade, uh, it is always an advantage to have a single currency. That we have, so to speak, a dollar standard is simply due to the fact that the United States is a supreme military power. Um, the, the United States was in favor of, intro, of the introduction of the euro because this way you only have to go to the central bank in Frankfurt and give them orders. Um, b before you had to go to uh, whatever to Bonn, and then you had to go to Paris, and then you had to go to Madrid, and all shaped them up. And then the euro was introduced to weaken, in particular, the German the German mark, because the composition of these central banking committees that are. They, they are they, now there's one German in it, or maybe two, if was, I'm not sure about these details anymore. When I, when I was still teaching that stuff, I knew these things. In the meantime, my interest in those things has somewhat declined. Um, but he, the German guy is now surrounded by a Spanish central banker, um, by a French central banker, by an Italian central banker. And, and one of these people is, the person is more incompetent than the next. Mrs. Mrs. Lagarde is a typical example. She came out saying, yeah, when there's inflation, yeah, we don't really understand the phenomenon of inflation, really. Um, I mean, what, you, what kind of statement is this from, uh, from the head of the European Central Bank? I mean, we understand the nature of inflation for hundreds of years. And, and that woman, she has, of, of, I don't know what her background is. She, maybe she runs a, a, sun, she runs a, 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 sun, a suntan salon. Uh, I mean, she must spend plenty of time in the suntan salon to look at her. So, um, Dr. Hopper, I completely agree with you that uh, we should weep. Um, so, when I said, uh, I asked a question yesterday saying, oh, you know, inflation is rampant and people in Turkey seem, no, I, I didn't say it's okay. I am saying that given, you know, over the COVID crisis for the past two years, people were okay not support, well, we're okay by the government lock them down, uh, closing their business, injecting something into their body they don't like, but they can put up with it. So, I mean, for the inflation that the Germans or the Europeans that they are going to experience, or the war that, uh, you know, many people will be killed, if they can put up with what they experience, in COVID, which is already so bad, and they can still support the government, then what else can stop them from stopping, you know, the craziest thing that's going on in Ukraine? What can stop them? And <laughs> my, and, and my other, and, uh, and except weeping, what else can we in individual do? 
um, and also uh, I doubt if the Ukraine, like Ukraine or Russia, what they do may not be so much matter, but I, I'm thinking about whether the financial market in response to the high inflation or the anticipated higher interest rate, would there be a scenario that the collapse of it may stop all the crazy things going on? Uh, please, for, for everyone on the panel. Yeah, yeah, of course, in a way, you would want to hope for some sort of economic collapse in order to shape up the governments. On the other hand, the economic collapses sometimes lead to even worse results. Um, I mean, yeah, then the call for a strong man usually arises. Uh, somebody that gets us out of the trouble. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see any... Uh, I'm pretty sure that there will be an economic collapse. What comes out of this economic collapse? That depends, of course, to a large extent on the state of public, op public opinion. Um, but currently, all voices like mine or most of the people here have no hearing. Um, there are very few people ca who can break through to the mainstream media, appear on TV, that are allowed to say these things. On the other hand, I'm, I'm s I have not lost all my optimism. I, I appeared on, on some Austrian TV shows for a few times and said these sorts of things. And Based on the number of letters that I get then, I would say, hey, what I say, lots of people think the same way. There are opinion polls in Austria, where my impression is a third of the Austrian people agreed with me when I said, you have to immediately stop the sanctions and then you can have warm showers again. Um, but uh, as I said, there's only one TV station in the entire uh, German-speaking area that once in a while admits crazy people like me to say a few words. The rest of it, they would never touch me. On German TV, for instance, they would not dare to invite me. Because as, as you know, I'm not all that friendly towards these people. Do, Do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I would like to uh, uh, remind, remind you that uh, when, when you think about these questions, questions you ask these questions, questions and they all have the setting of society, uh, and the answers all go in the direction of society. All these structures, these are, stru these are structures behind your question and structures behind the, uh, the answer. But there are other ways of survival. And I discussed uh, the convivial orders and the community orders. Uh, apart from uh, society, societal orders, because societal orders are, by definition, governed orders. They have and need a government, or they cannot function. But com community orders and conviviality orders, they are not governed. They have a, a very different political philosophy. Now, for lack of time, I did not go into the political uh, philosophy aspect. But the traditional, even, even the language has disappeared. And I make it clear, uh, the traditional way for speaking about the governance, not the government, but the governance of communal uh, convivial orders is in terms of rulers. Rulers are the judges, uh, and the, uh, at one point uh, someone mentioned, I think it was, uh, I don't remember who it was, it was uh, the, the, the biblical book of uh, Samuel, yeah. so the, uh, the reference was to uh, people want a king right, in, the, in the Bible, and 
this was despite the advice of the wise man, the ruler, uh, the judge, uh, Samuel. Now, the, the ruler uh, advises people, but he has no commanding power. And when the people uh, asked for a king, they wanted, they wanted someone, the strong man, who would be able to do great things just by speaking them into existence, the commander. Uh, and if we speak to other people, we know we cannot command them. That's the experience of daily life. But nowadays, everything is projected onto a societal scene, which is majestic. Right? And it goes to, uh, it has many rooms, and nobody has ever seen all the rooms, and we are easily impressed with the things governors say. Right? I once had a discussion with the, uh, a later disgraced politician uh, in my country, and he says, he was uh, at that time the uh, economics minister, and he began his speech with saying, uh, I am so busy, I hardly see my top functionaries except at the weddings of their daughters. Right? And then he ended his speech two hours later saying, well, somebody has to have a good overview of the situation uh, to make the final decision. He was talking about himself, right? So he doesn't know what happened, but he, has, he claims to have an overview of everything. And, and he gets, gets away with it because nobody else has an overview of everything. So, so he's bluffing his way through. And, and the whole language of centralized control is really bluff, right? But, but as long, long as the bluff works, the, the, the centralization seems to work. But, but it's a, a house of cards. And this uh, can collapse at any moment, right? What, what you, you want, want, you need in a way is a session, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, no, the, the session is movements. Um, I mean, mean the, the start of that would be the dissolution, dissolution of the European Union, Union and maybe then, then, then it continues and uh, smaller and smaller units are breaking away and you have then again communal relationships instead of what you call society or relationships. Um, but but whether, that, whether that is in the cards, I'm also not so sure. Uh, I, I like very much when you said, you know, it's, it's a house of cards and, um, and actually it, it's not a, not a, a stable um, situation. Maybe, maybe this was uh, you were alluding to, and, and my approach would be. I mean, this is a very, very fundamental question. How, how should it go on, and, and how is it possible to, to um, you know, communicate this way of thinking and looking at and to 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 see how it is? Um, I sometimes compare it with, you know, uh, what what happened to the church, namely the Catholic Church. There were times where the church was absolutely an authority. Everybody obeyed to it. Um, they were very strict against heretics. You know that um, that 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 were the very big danger for the structure because um, the belief in the system could be challenged. And I think that that is an interesting approach to challenge the belief in this crazy statism uh, that in truth these are violent gangs how hans put it before which is just true you know these are organizations that that they, they steal money from from the people things like that and to to show that and to speak about it to to write about it to to um, communicate this, this way of thinking. And if, if this works, beside many other things, beside maybe um, some specific secession programs, things like that, but then perhaps happens to the state the same what happened to the church. The church was never abolished. The church was forgotten. 
Of course, yes, there is a church, that's true, some go there and that's fine if they are convinced of that system, but it's their church and nobody dares to force somebody to be a member of that church anymore and it could be that way. I, I remember um, on the very small basis in Switzerland um, when, when people began to, to um, Austrian to, to uh, withdraw from the from the church, um, the church, uh, and in Switzerland there is a tradition that church taxes, um, that there are church taxes depending on the official taxes, a certain percentage. You know, They're very crazy, but that's that's the system in many cantons in in uh, Switzerland. And in that time, when many people went out of the church, they declared their exit of, of the church, the church came to them and tried to negotiate the rate of the tax, you know. Um, would you remain a member when you just pay half of the usual, things like that? And, and maybe, maybe uh, when it goes in such a direction that people just are not interested in anymore, in these crazy structures that they they do not believe in it, that they laugh at it, things like that. Maybe, maybe, maybe that could be an approach to work on, to speak about these crazy structures. Thank you very much for your presentations, gentlemen. Uh, in the next few uh, days, we will leave bo uh, planet Bodrum and uh, turn through the real world. So we need some practical advice. Now, starting from the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, how should a person from a libertarian point of view deal with a bully, with a superior bully? Could you develop, each of you maybe briefly develop this, how should I deal with my own state and how should I deal with foreign bully states? What's the right attitude? Is there, are there anything, is there anything general that we can say, or is this? You, you didn't understand? Yeah, do, do, do you hear me? Okay. How, how should, a, is there anything general that we can say about how a libertarian should deal with a bully? his own government and a f superior foreign government. Wisdom, this is all I can say. Um, you, have to, you have to assess how dangerous is this bully, uh, how many allies would I have if I go against him, uh, uh, how much should I tolerate, when should I uh, give up, move someplace else. I think you, do you have an answer to that question? <laughs> no, but <laughs> you are the expert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no more an expert on these types of questions than you are. You see, I mean, this is, this is just, by and large, you have this problem also on, on, uh, one-to-one -one level. Hmm. Um, I mean, if, if you have a really nasty lab, neighbor, um, what, what can you do about this nasty uh, neighbor? Uh, sometimes it's easy. You, uh, you, you get your friends together and give them one on the nose. Um, Unfortunately, that's not so easy with uh, places like Russia, I guess. I mean, I, I can't go to Putin and give him one on the nose. Or, uh, I think making, making fun of one's own gangsters is probably uh, an advisable strategy. It will be difficult for them um, to attack you if you only make fun of them because in order to attack other people you need a certain amount of support from 
from me on your own on your own side. I mean, if if all people around me uh, said he just made a joke about such and such, you cannot possibly dare to to kill him or jail him or so. But when that point is reached, how many jokes you can make and how drastic the jokes can be, there's also a question of wisdom. You see, you have to understand, this brings us back to understanding as a, uh, as a method of, uh, of the social sciences. Yes, we, we must understand our enemies. Um, I mean, people like me are criticized for being Putin, uh, Putin versteher, Putin understander. Um, but, but understanding somebody does not mean that you agree with this. Um, it just means that you have to find out what their motives are, uh, what, what their goals are, and then you have to adjust to this. I don't think there is a general rule that that applies to this. There can be thousands of different situations that require thousands of different answers to, to it. But you give me the answer tonight. Uh, you know, I, you, why do you make, ask difficult questions like this? <laughs> I, I still didn't understand fully. The bully is that now Putin, or is that just once you have a problem with some gang leader, so to speak? Also our own bullies. Oh. On? No, no, you, 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 I'm hurt and Simonetta, uh, Zamaruga, whatever uh, you people. Uh, 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 uh. So. I mean, maybe it's, it's the same question we, we had before, how, how do we approach this problem altogether? Is that, um, so, so just how to deal with the realities of, of these uh, statist structures? And, um, and I think that then again, we have this, this, this problem of um, that, that people believe in it, and then it's very difficult to convince them or to uh, inform them that it's not worth believing it anymore in these structures. And I think it's always a, a, a big dilemma when, when you, when you um, try to um, position yourself within this scheme. Shall you, shall you enter into these structures in order to change them from the inside? There are approaches like that, that people, libertarians, um, uh, they, they um, compete for being elected in some um, parliaments or so, in order then to, you know, to, to try to change the whole system. But I think that won't be a, a consistent way, because maybe on a psychological level, you will become part of that system earlier or so sooner or later. Like, like the, Green, the Green Party, when they entered in, in, in the parliament in, in Germany many decades ago, already they said, we, we, we are only for two years, then we change. And I think the first change did not play, uh, take place. So um, these are illusions, I think. Maybe it could be a program I, I, I thought about once uh, to, um, to um, compete for election with the program to liquidate this organization. So you won't be elected as the CEO or so in, in, in economic terms, but the liquidator. And the job is to liquidate. There will be no actions anymore concerning going further, but liquidation, you know, that could be a program. I do not know that at this moment you have much success with it, but that could be a consistent way to try to do it from the internal um, uh, approach. Frank is the oldest here, even older than I am, so he will be, he has accumulate more wisdom, so maybe he, may, maybe he knows the answer to this complicated question. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a complicated question, but 
uh, if you project it into the societal uh, background, then of course the the bully, uh, the man with the tattoos, uh, who will smash your head in and things like that, you do not have to fear him because he will just pass and, and go away. The, the real bullies are the administrators, the people at the top who will uh, revoke your license to do whatever because you have in a society people do not have do not have rights that does not exist in a society we talk about uh, rights in society but that is a memory of earlier times when societies were small compared to the communal convivial order right the christian world was the, the ruling idea and it imposed order and ideas of right and wrong on the world. But the moment societies rise above all these ingrained uh, sources of value and normativeness, uh, you lose the, the possibility of uh, arguing for right and wrong because it is decided for you and it is not decided in terms of right and wrong, it is decided in terms of this is the efficient uh, or the effective policy that we are pursuing. And you are permitted to join it. If you do not, then we will revoke your license or you, you, you pay more taxes or whatever. Uh, this is the kind of bullying that is most effective because it can be uh, started and propagated with a single word at the top of the social hierarchy, right? We saw that in the, the COVID period, why did all these uh, independent or self-employed people suddenly uh, put on masks or close their doors and do all these silly things? Because, not because they were so afraid of the virus, but they were, I, I am going to lose my license. Doctors were afraid to speak sense to their patients. I am going to lose my license. I am not a, it's not a free profession, as they sometimes call themselves still. They are functionaries of a huge machinery. And that is the, the bullying power, right? But you, you can, as an individual, you, you can uh, oppose it at the lowest level. The, the man at the desk, uh, not the higher-ups, but the man as, at the desk, you can still talk to him. It's not very easy to do so, but you, you can always uh, bluff him down. Right? So I remember one occasion when I, for some silly reason, he refused to uh, accept my, my uh, photo for my passport because it, it was not recent enough. And then he turned it around and said, see, it's, it has a blue black, uh, background, a blue background, so that proves it's too old. I said, you shouldn't get excited. And he said, why should I not ex uh, get excited? I said, you didn't make these silly regulations, did, uh, did you? Right? And he turned away, put a stamp on it, and he gave me my passport. <laughs> but these are very small uh, consolations uh, you do not defeat a bureaucracy in that way, right? You, uh, a bu defeating a bureaucracy uh, is almost impossible unless it defeats itself, when it makes itself so hated or so incompetent uh, that it collapses as another house of cards. But as long as there are cars <laughs> available, they build another one, that's, that's for sure. One more question, and then we are done. I have a question. Um, Hans, I, I do agree with your analysis of the current situation, but I still have a doubt. Uh, given uh, as the world has been going in lockstep during the last two years, I think I am afraid that the push towards a one world government is way further ahead than we think. And so I have a doubt. Is it possible that it is all 
a great show, like David Durer would say, and that Putin is part of the show, and th it is very useful to have this war going on, because this is useful to do what they are doing, destroying Europe, destroying uh, little businesses, and so on. So this is my, my doubt. Maybe it's all part of a great scheme, of a great representation they are uh, pushing forward to our disadvantage. Yeah, you are revealed now as one of the biggest conspiracy theorists that I have heard in a while, you know. Uh, that might well, be, might well be true. I would like to see a little bit more evidence of it, but again, we are dealing with extremely evil people on all sides. Who knows what they have, uh, uh, have done and arranged in the, uh, in the back rooms uh, of which uh, only very few people have an idea. I doubt it, however, because yeah, any type, I mean, that would require a conspiracy, obviously. Um, but conspiracies are difficult, uh, difficult to uh, organize. Um, somebody has always an incentive to spill the beans. Um, that's all I can say. I, I wouldn't rule it out. Currently, I don't see enough reasons to think that way. Um, for. Uh, for the reason that conspiracies, very small conspiracies, are easy to do. Uh, three, four, five people can do something like this. But as soon as more than of people are involved, they, they, they have to be quiet. No, nobody should spill the beans. Uh, the larger the group is, the more difficult it is not to have somebody who does spill the beans. Well, there's a, a remark by Marshall McLuhan, the uh, communication uh, specialist, which was very, who was very famous when I was younger. Uh, and he said, uh, remember, only the small secrets have to be protected. The big secrets are protected by the, uh, the, the mentality of the public. They will not, re they will not refuse it. They will not believe it because they refuse to, they can't be that bad or they can't be that. So that, that's a factor you have to uh, reckon into the, the equation. And of course the, uh, the, the uh, notion of the open conspiracy, which was, which was launched uh, towards the end of the 19th century in the circles of uh, where H.G. Uh, Wells uh, was active. That's, basically the same idea. You, you conspire, but you do it so openly that people think, hey, that, that must be okay, otherwise they would not be doing it. That's open conspiracy. So what's your assessment then? Is that, is that going on? That, that Z and Putin and Biden are all uh, working on the same project? Uh, I think that would be a, a rash conclusion. <laughs> but uh, it is true, of course, that uh, even Putin was once a, a member of the Young Leaders Program of the World Economic Forum. But I, I, I think he's not the best pupil <laughs> in the class. <laughs> Oh, come on. No, that's enough to, for today. So, um, so I, I thank you all for listening, and we will see each other at, uh, at dinner time. <laughs> <laughs>